Thank you so much. How many of you expect God to fill you more and more tonight, tomorrow? Yes, amen. Please be seated. It's good to be a part of this Holy Spirit conference and to see what God has in store for us. Praise God. We've been uh, studying over the last couple of evenings, uh, uh, last evening and Sunday morning, we've been studying about being empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we're using the book of Acts to instruct us and teach us about what it means to be empowered by the Spirit. So on Sunday morning, we learned about the fullness of the Spirit, amen, where we saw it promised, poured out at the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and all the things that resulted from that. It's so, so very important for us to keep in mind. Then we noticed then in chapter 3 last night what we called an, extra, an encounter with the extraordinary. And we see that Peter and John had this great encounter with the lame man and we learned hopefully much from that last night. So tonight we want to continue on and tomorrow night we will continue on also looking at these episode moments out of the book of Acts that teach us about being empowered by the Spirit of God. And by the way, tomorrow night, I'd like to challenge you to come with an extra measure of expectation. Uh, I, I plan to, on Wednesday night service, which will be our, our finale of this, uh, of this conference, to have a special time set apart for some personal prophetic ministry over the church, over individuals as the Holy Spirit would prompt us to. And we'll just trust the Holy Spirit to manifest his gifts in a powerful way tomorrow night. Amen? Amen. But for tonight... We're going to dig into God's Word. How many of you love God's Word? You know that it's powerful, it's alive. We need it every day, every May, every day. So when the the manna was available for the children of Israel in the the wilderness, how many of you know that it wasn't a a once-a-week occurrence? They had to get the manna how often? Every day. Every day we need God's Word. Amen? Amen? So let us pray and invite the Holy Spirit to teach us tonight. Lord, we've been waiting upon you. We've been worshiping you. We've been standing in the midst of your presence. And now we ask, Holy Spirit, you as the teacher, you as the equipper, you as the revealer, you as the one that gives life to us, we ask that you would take the word of God that is living and powerful, cause it to to find a place deep in our minds and in our hearts. Lord, our minds need to be renewed. They need to be refreshed. They need to be clean. Lord, we ask tonight as we study the word, let it be an additional uh, addition to that helmet of salvation that guards our minds. Let the word of God instruct us in righteousness. Let it instruct us on how to live and how to be the church of Jesus Christ in this hour and in this day. We thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We trust you to minister to each and every one of us, and we promise to give you all the glory. And all the saints agreed and said amen. Amen Amen and amen. Well, listen, tonight we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 8. If you would just turn in your Bibles to that portion of Scripture so that you are ready. And Acts chapter 8, before we start reading there, uh, I want to remind you of something that Jesus stated in Matthew chapter 16 as he was sharing with his disciples. They happened to be in a place called Caesarea Philippi. He was gathering them together. They were having a special intimate time. And Jesus inquired among his disciples. He said, who do people say that I am? It was kind of like Jesus taking a market survey. You know, he was trying to get an idea of what is the market? What's going on in the marketplace? And they said, well, some say you're this, some say you're that, some say you're this. And Then he got down to the real heart of the matter, as only Jesus can. He said, well, who do you say that I am? That's what really matters, doesn't it? Amen. Who do we say that he is? And then Peter spoke up and said, I know, Jesus, I have the answer. He said, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You're the Son of God. And Jesus responded to Peter and said, good job, Peter. You got a good grade on that exam because you got the correct answer. But that answer that you just gave 
did not come to you from your own human insight or revelation. He said, this answer came to you by revelation. And then Jesus made a powerful statement, one of the most powerful statements he ever made. And he said, I will build my church. I will build my church. And he said, and even the gates of hell will not be able to stand against it because it will be a powerful church. It will be a militant church. It will be an overcoming church. It will be an unstoppable church. That's the kind of church that I've designed. How many of you know that Jesus is the head of the church? He is the architect. He is the builder of the church and he is the builder of also local churches. So if we want our church, we want this church, or whatever church that you are leading in, if we want it to be blessed, if we want it to become everything that God has intended, we need to learn what God's Word tells us about that church. So the title of my message tonight is An Unstoppable Church. An Unstoppable Church. We're going to see that unstoppable church here in the book of Acts, beginning in chapter 8. And so what I'm going to do is, uh, let, let me just give you a broad outline of what I'm going to cover, and then uh, we'll go through and read portion by portion of Acts chapter 8. So we're going to talk about these three things tonight. If you want to write them down, that's fine. I'll repeat them as we go through. Number one, we're going to look at how martyrdom ignited persecution. Martyrdom ignited persecution. Number two, we're going to look how persecution prompts true evangelism. How persecution prompts true evangelism. And then we're going to see number three, how true evangelism exposes false faith. All right, so y'all ready for this? I know some of you are already discouraged. You're like, oh my gosh, he's going to talk about martyrdom. He's going to talk about persecution tonight. This doesn't sound very, very edifying, does it? But I think you're going to see where it actually is encouraging to see because we're talking about something that actually occurred to the early church. So remember the history up to this particular point. We have the early church being birthed in Acts chapter 2. We see it being established. The church at Jerusalem grew by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. It started off with 3,000 salvations on its very first day. It became organized. They went through a number of different challenges in the early church. Persecution had already begun to break out against the leaders of the church, against the apostles of the church. They would drag them off and then they would come back even more powerful and the church would pray and God would fill them again with the Holy Spirit. And then the church uh, began to have challenges and they appointed deacons to help take some of the pressure off the pastors and the apostles. And all of this has been going on at the church. All at this point up to Acts chapter 8 has been happening in one location. All of that has been happening in the city of Jerusalem. So the church, the early church, the first church had been confined at this stage only to Jerusalem. Now they were meeting in homes, they were meeting in the temple courts, and the church had spread out with thousands of people throughout the city, but they had never taken the gospel of Jesus outside of their own borders. It had been confined into Jerusalem. All right? That's an important thing to remember as we begin to look here at Acts chapter 8. So I'm going to read to you, first of all, the first three verses that tell us that martyrdom ignited persecution. All right? Y'all ready for this? Chapter 8 and verse 1. And this is a strange section because... If you look at it in your Bibles, it, it feels like chapter 8 is at a strange division that they put Acts chapter 8. So um, I don't know exactly why they did it, but I will begin in eight, chapter 8, verse 1. It says, and Saul was there giving approval to his death. Let's wait just a moment. He was where? You have to go back to Acts chapter 7 to find out where Saul was. Saul was present at the stoning of Stephen. It was at his death 
at his stoning, at his martyrdom, the scripture all of a sudden decides to introduce us to this man named Saul, who is to later become the Apostle Paul. Isn't that an interesting introduction? So anyway, he goes on to say, that's the first verse, and he goes on to say, and on that day, the day of Stephen's martyrdom and death, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and he put them in prison. So we see that martyrdom ignited persecution. It's interesting that this begins with an emphasis on Stephen's death, what had happened in the previous chapter. We don't have the time to go back and read it. If you are a little bit fuzzy about it, I challenge you, go back and read what happened with Stephen. He preaches this dynamic message, a powerful, convicting message. It was so convicting, it made all the people who were listening angry. I mean, it was powerful. They were angry because they were being convicted. And yet Stephen just was a man full of the Spirit, chapter 7 tells us. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit. He just looked up into heaven and he said, God, I'm just here serving you. You do whatever you want to do. The Bible says that his face looked like that of an angel because he actually could see Jesus at the right hand of God. And his incredible ministry, his faith and the Holy Spirit in his life was so so powerful. It caused all of those religious leaders, the Jewish leaders of that day, and the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees to rise up against him. And they took Stephen and they stoned him to death. And we see in Acts chapter 8, Saul was there. Did you know this is our introduction to Saul? Quite an introduction, isn't it? First time we know much about Saul. But here we find him being a vicious, crazy persecutor. He was a crazy man. He actually was, this is obviously before his conversion, but he was vicious, crazed, possessed with hatred for Christians. And he was very at least he was, if he didn't organize Stephen's death, he at least was supporting it. He was present. It is clear to us. Now this death of Stephen, you and I might think, this is so sad. And yes, we do see that the, the believers who, and the godly men who uh, were gathered around Stephen and buried him, they were mourning They were so sad for his loss. But let's make sure that we keep this in perspective. Stephen's death was not actually an end. It was a beginning. What looked like it was negative was actually going to turn into a positive. How many of you know that only God can take bad things and turn them into good things? Amen. And what seemed, like, what seemed like the worst thing that could have happened to the church, one of their leaders, he began, Stephen began as one of the appointed servants in the church, wasn't he? So as a leader in the church, I mean, it's difficult to lose a leader like that and, and especially to being persecuted just because he was full of faith and preached the word of God. But God had a plan. And he used the killing of Stephen as like it was igniting a fuse. He was igniting that persecution, literally ignited something within the church. Little did the church know at that time that the death of Stephen was just the beginning of what was getting ready to happen for them. It actually, the scripture tells us, that it ignited a broad-based persecution against all the Christians in Jerusalem. 
Up to this point, most of the persecution had been limited to leaders. Apostles here, apostles here, now Stephen. But this incident with Stephen set off a series of things that created total, outright persecution against the church. No one in Jerusalem was safe from the persecution. And so here in these first verses that we read, we see very clearly that persecution had broke out against the church. There in verse 1, the end of verse 1, you say, on that day, on that very day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. This was the great persecution that history records for us as taking place under the oversight of Nero. And this was an incredible, pivotal moment in the life of the early church. Now remember the title of my message tonight is what? An Unstoppable Church. You might say, well, it doesn't look unstoppable right now. It looks like it's bad news. I mean, everybody, bad stuff is happening. Everybody, Stephen's gotten killed and the pressure's on everybody. Persecution, they were beating up Christians and they were abusing them and taking advantage of them. How can anything good come out of that? Let's look at the second main point that I want to present tonight. Number two is that persecution prompts true evangelism. Persecution prompts true evangelism. Now we see this from verse 4 through verse 8. So let me read those verses to you now. Those who had been scattered preached the word of God wherever they went. I want to stop right there. You say, what do you mean scattered? We read that up in verse 1. It said that all the Christians, try to picture this, all the members of the church of Jerusalem were scattered. We're talking thousands of people, all except for the primary leadership, the apostles of the church. They were scattered. What were they doing? They were running every direction that they could go to get out of Jerusalem. For what? For safety. The pictures, it was so hot in Jerusalem, they literally had to scatter. So now we find here Dr. Luke picking up that, and he says in verse 4, those who had been scattered, who was, who was scattered? Everybody. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and they saw the miraculous signs that he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed that day. So there was great joy in that city. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, this is turning better, isn't it? Now, let me mention several things to you. First of all, this scattering that we see taking place was actually, I believe, a fulfillment of something Jesus had said in Acts chapter 1. Do you remember that Jesus had said to his followers, he said, after the Holy Spirit's come upon you, you're going to receive power. The purpose is for power to be witnesses. And you're going to be witnesses for me in Jerusalem was it going to stop in Jerusalem? He said, you're going to be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, but also in the regions of Judea and Samaria. Those were outlying areas around Jerusalem. You're going to be witnesses for me in Judea and Samaria. And he even said, and all over the earth. That's what this power of the Holy Spirit is for. But you might say, well, what happened here at this scattering? This scattering or the dispersion of the early church, I believe happened, and this is my theory, all right? You can develop your own theory when you preach. You give your theory. Whatever. <laughs> so this is my theory, all right? My theory is this. I think that the early church got comfortable. I think they became or very comfortable in their, we call it their comfort zone. They were in their comfort zone. 
they were just enjoying having church. They were just enjoying being together with brothers and sisters in Christ and raising their families with the great atmosphere of God. Everything was great. They were in Jerusalem and a lot of activity and it was, was a great place to live and everything was comfortable and everything was good. But they forgot that Jesus said, I'm calling you to go into all the nations of the world and make disciples. They forgot about their, full, their purpose was to not selfishly just be a consumer. Not just a consumer. They were supposed to make a difference. They were supposed to take this message and literally spread it across the world. But the church had become comfortable. They had, they had become casual in the way that they approached their lives. You know what? Don't think too poorly of them because it happens to us today too. Don't be too critical because the same thing happens to us. It's so easy for us, particularly in, in our society where there's benefits and things are going well and we have a job and we have an income and we're raising, we get married and we're raising a family and all of a sudden it's easy. We wake up one day and we go, wow, 10 years of my life is just phew, gone. 20 years of my life, phew. but we're comfortable. And when we get overly casual and comfortable, it is easy for us to lose sight and lose focus on what God's true purpose is for us and for the church. Many of us are simply living our lives and we're not allowing God to use us like he wants to use us. It happened to the church at Jerusalem. And it became so comfortable that God in his wisdom and in his sovereignty, he allowed one of their leaders, Stephen, to be killed. And he allowed persecution to be stirred up against the early church for what purpose? If they weren't going to leave voluntarily, he was going to help them leave. I believe that it was God turning up the temperature in the room to where it became so uncomfortable, they're like, we've got to go. They had no choice but to leave for the sake of their own lives. But I suggest to you tonight that God had a purpose. What he was trying to do is to shake it up. You know, we talk about the, the believers and being salt and light in the world, right? We're supposed to be salt and light. But sometimes we need to get the salt out of the salt shaker. It's not enough just to keep the salt in the salt shaker. We've got to apply the salt to the people who need it, to the unreached world. Amen. And so this, this story is all about God shaking up the church in order to scatter and send them. It wasn't voluntary. God had to turn up the heat to get them to go. But I want you to see what happened when they went. This is remarkable. As they began to be scattered, the scripture simply told us this. It says that as they were scattered, they preached the word wherever they went. I'm so impressed by that. You say, well, why are you impressed? Because that tells me that these believers were trained they were, had already been equipped. They knew they had so much word stored up in them. They had been receiving and receiving and receiving and receiving and being equipped and equipped. And now all of a sudden they were scattered. And it says, and as they were scattered, wherever they went, those that went north, those that went south, those that went east, those that went west, wherever they were scattered, Judea and Samaria scattered. Thousands of believers scattered. But it says that as they went wherever they were, whatever road they were on, whatever little village they were in, whatever highway they were on, what do they do? They were always just sharing the word of God. Telling people about the love of God. Telling people about the power that they had experienced. They were sharing their stories, their life stories about how that Jesus had changed their life. They were proclaiming the word. I want you to notice that the apostles, those that were the, the if you will, the, the, uh, the most 
anointed. Where were they? They were left in Jerusalem. All the great mighty men of God. Those who would preach every Sunday. Where were they? Back in Jerusalem. Who were these people being scattered? Just ordinary Christians. They were the believers. And they were doing what? They were preaching. They were sharing. They were proclaiming. Every one of them. This is a broad, general statement about the church being scattered. And it was, it was becoming that unstoppable church because the word was in them. And now they were sharing it with people. They would meet a stranger on the road and they would begin to talk to them and share with them about God and the good news of Jesus Christ. They would exchange money for food in the marketplace and they would share about the love of God with, their, with the people that they would meet. Everywhere they went, they were sharing Jesus is this an example for us today it's a great example this is the true unstoppable church yeah they were scattered but they were sharing the gospel wherever they went now this second point that I'm making here is that persecution prompts what true evangelism true evangelism they're being scattered, they're sharing the gospel. And I want you to notice, if you can go to the next slide, I want you to notice that there are, in this story that we just read, there are three characteristics of true evangelism. When there is true evangelism taking place, the church is being unstoppable as it's being scattered, even in the midst of adversity, problems. The church is being scattered. I want you to notice there are three characteristics of true evangelism number one number one is the centrality of Jesus Christ we said that we see that in verse 4 and 5 and it says those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went Philip went down to a city in Samaria and he proclaimed the Christ there the centrality of Jesus Christ what did what did Philip proclaim He's simply one of everybody that got scattered. But what was he doing? He was sharing about who? He wasn't sharing about the recent news. He wasn't talking about the coronavirus. He was talking about what? Jesus Christ. He was the centrality of his message. He was his focus. He was the center of his attention. And so it tells us, Philip says everybody was sharing the word. And it says specifically, Philip just began to talk about the Christ. The word there is? The Messiah, the one who was the fulfillment of everything that they had known as Jews. The centrality of Christ is the first characteristic of true evangelism. When you and I today, when we share Jesus, when we, when we want to share with someone, just don't tell them a cute story. Make sure that at some point you tell them about Christ. Try to, even in your friendships, at some point, if you really care about the people, you'll make sure you tell them. Say, so let me tell you about what Christ has done in my life. Christ has to be at the center of our message. Listen, today in too many places, we have great messages, teachings that are going forth on TV, on radio, in churches. And yet the name and the centrality of Jesus Christ is missing. You have all kind of messages about how to get wealthy how to do this, how to do that, how to do this. And at the end of the messages, I scratch my head and I go, wait a minute, where's Jesus Christ? When the Apostle Paul went in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said, when I came and I proclaimed the gospel to you, he said, I was committed to knowing nothing else except for one thing. I wasn't a brilliant guy, but I knew one thing for sure, Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is the centrality of my message. Listen to me, church. If you want to be an unstoppable church, you have got to use true evangelism. True evangelism. The first characteristic is Jesus Christ has to be the center. The center of it all. Center of your lifestyle. The center of your language. The center of your message as you share the centrality of Christ. Number two, the second characteristic of true evangelism that we read is in verses 6 and 7, and that is miracles will confirm it. 
Oh my, look, let, let's, let me read it again to you. When the crowds heard Philip, all right, what's he preaching? Christ. The people in Samaria, in the city in Samaria, they're listening to him, they're hearing him, and then what happened? So they heard, and then it says, and saw. Underline, you can underline both those words. They heard and they saw. They heard his message and they saw the miraculous signs. Everybody say signs. That he did. What's it talking about? Miracles. All different kinds of miraculous things. Philip was doing. Why? Because that's the way he had learned to do it. Because that's the way Jesus taught his disciples. And didn't Jesus say, even greater works will you do than I've done? Didn't Jesus say to the disciples, as the Father has sent me, so I'm now sending you? We are anointed by that same spirit. And it's not you and me doing miracles. It's the work of Jesus through us. But it explains to us what some of those miracles were. It says they all paid close attention to what he said. Notice that they were hearing him before. But when he started doing miracles, then all of a sudden they paid close attention to what he said. That's what miracles do. A miracle, a sign, and a wonder is there to do what? To confirm the validity of the gospel. It is there to tell people, we live, how many of y'all know, we, we live in a rationalistic, uh, intellectual world where people process everything up here in their heads. So to have faith in an invisible God, to believe that Jesus died for them personally, some people struggle with that, don't they? Huh? But you show them a miracle. You let them see something supernatural that they don't know, they can't explain. It's unexplainable. It's inexplicable. Then what will they do? They'll pay close attention. They heard what Philip said, but when he started doing miracles, boy, he really got their attention. And then all kinds of revival breaks out. Look what it says happened. And he said, and they started listening to what he said, verse 7, and with shrieks, loud noises, evil spirits started coming out of people. Many people who were paralyzed and cripples there were healed. It's giving us general descriptions of what was going on in this city in Samaria. Listen to me. Revival was breaking out. In a place who had never ever heard the good news of Jesus Christ. And as these early disciples were scattered, they went under the power of the Holy Spirit. They began to share about Jesus Christ. And Jesus confirmed the word with signs and wonders and miracles. This wasn't because of Philip's unique anointing. This is because of his willingness to simply share Jesus Christ boldly. And God did the miracles. We're told that Jesus will do that in Mark chapter 16, right? At the end of Mark chapter 16, when he lists the things that we'll do supernaturally, he said, and God worked with them with signs and miracles and wonders following his word. Why? He confirms his word through miracles. I want to challenge you, church. Not as an organization. I want to challenge you as individuals. Start expecting Jesus to confirm your word with signs and wonders. There is no one here. There is not one person here that God is not more than willing to confirm. We have to simply increase our faith. We have to start expecting it. We've got to start sharing Jesus more prolifically and expecting his confirmation. Uh, before I go to the last point here, I, I, let me just share this story. It happened recently for me. I, I could tell you some uh, wonderful stories that have happened in the past about how God confirms his word. Um, there, was a, uh, there was a lady who had come to a special service that we were having, and we had a guest there who was, um, she was very gifted in uh, prophetic worship and sharing prophetic insights that the Lord would give her. And in a meeting, she would typically, she would call people forward and she would give them prophetic message to them. And there was a lady who was attending for the very first time that night. 
and she told her friend, they came together, two ladies. They came together because they had heard that this lady was a gifted singer and they wanted to come listen to her. And so when they came, they, uh, uh, this, the first lady was sitting there in the meeting and she began to listen to this lady give prophecies to people who were there. Let me take off my jacket if y'all don't mind. So she started giving prophecies and the lady, it was her very first time there, she really didn't believe this stuff was real. She said to herself, you know, Lord, if this is real, have that lady give me a word and have her do something totally different. In other words, she really was putting God to the test. Have her give me a personal hug. Now, there was 300 people in the room. She said, have her give me a personal hug. She's thinking this to herself. So the lady who was there ministering walked from one side to the other of the, of the sanctuary. And she walked to the side, the lady sitting halfway towards the back, and she called her out. And she gave her an encouraging word. And then she walks away, and she walks halfway across the sanctuary, and she stops. Turned around. She walks back. She said, you who I just spoke to, come here just a moment. She had her come up. She gave her this, this big hug. She said, God just told me you needed a big hug. <laughs> and her friend who was sitting next to her, who also was skeptical. Her friend who, was sitting, who came with her was also skeptical. Her and her husband had been going through a three-year uh, challenge with the Internal Revenue Service tax people and they had to pay large sums of money into the tax service for some disagreement that their business had with the government. So they paid about $20,000 that they didn't expect to have to pay. <clears throat> so she is sitting there and she says, she says to herself Lord I, I, I really need a word from the Lord. And if, if this is genuine, I, I, I need something personal that I'll know for sure is you. Did you know that right before the meeting was finished, the lady had limited time. She said, listen, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to divide the room up into half. So for this half of the room, she prophesied to them and gave a general word of encouragement. Then she said, now for this side of the room, she prophesied and she gave a word of encouragement. In, when she was prophesying over this part of the room where this la these ladies were sitting, she said, and there's... A few of you sitting here on this side of the room who are having problems paying taxes. And God says to you that he's going to return the money that you already had to pay in. And he will also give you even more than that. Well, this lady leaves the meeting thinking, well, I'm one of a hundred and some odd people sitting. I mean, and she's thinking, that's amazing. So she just thought, well... That could be just an accident. She goes home. The following morning, the following morning, she went and got the mail, and in the mail was a letter from the Internal Revenue Service of the United States of America, and she opened up the envelope, and there was a check for the full amount of money that they had paid in, the $20,000, plus another check that was for said, this is for the interest that you should have earned on the money. And there was no letter. It was, that was it. Just the checks. There was no letter of information. That doesn't sound like the government, does it? No, it doesn't sound like the government. There was no explanation. She just had two checks for $20,586 in her hand. When her husband came home, he said, I'm taking this to the bank right now. He went to the bank and he made sure that the checks were good. God, my point is that those are supernatural things that God did for those two ladies because they were skeptical. God wanted to prove he was real. He wanted to prove and demonstrate to them, I love you so much. I'm willing to even point out something like that. Isn't that good? Give God a hand. Hallelujah. Wow. So we said, so we said there are three characteristics of the true 
evangelism, true evangelism. Number one, we said that it's the centrality of Jesus Christ. Number two, miracles will confirm the word. And number three, there will be a presence of joy. When there's true evangelism, joy fills that place. When revival really breaks out, there's joy in the church. The scripture says it very specifically right here. Right there in verse 8. So, after all these people were healed and demons were cast out, so there was great joy in that city. Hallelujah. Great joy. Why? Because true evangelism was taking place. Listen, persecution, as bad as it was, was prompting true evangelism. People in these foreign lands were coming to Christ. Their lives are being changed, and there's great joy in the city. All right, I have one more point to share with you, and uh, it gets really exciting, so let, let's make sure we pay attention to this as we conclude. Starting in verse 9, through verse 24, we see the third main section of this story, and that is the true evangelism exposes false faith. True evangelism exposes false faith. Are you ready for this? I'm going to start reading in verse 9. So remember what's happening here. Revival's happening, right? All these people are coming to Jesus. Miracles are happening. Demons are being cast out. People are getting healed. Miraculous things. And then we find it in verse 9. Now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city. This is a magician. All right? Using demonic powers to do magic. Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people in Samaria. Everybody, in other words, everybody knew about Simon, the magician. Everybody knew about him. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, in other words, people of every income level, every social status, everybody high and low gave him their attention. And they exclaimed, saying this, this man is the divine power known as the great power. That was his brand, the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for such a long time with his magic. Watch this, verse 12. But when they believed Philip, Philip shows up. And all of a sudden, when they put faith in the message of Philip, watch what happens. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, those people from Samaria, they were baptized. Now, that's speaking specifically of water baptism. So when people would come to Christ, one of the first things that they would do is they would take them and baptize them as a declaration that they're following Jesus Christ. And all these people were baptized, both men and women. Verse 13, Simon, what is, this is critical. Simon himself, Simon the great power, Simon the sorcerer, the magician, himself believed. And was baptized. You know, no one is too lost. No one is too deceived. No one is too far gone for Jesus. Amen? And he then followed Philip everywhere he went. He was astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw Peter do. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. And when they arrived, they prayed for them who? Peter and John, they're praying for all these people who had come to Jesus, including Simon, right? They prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because, watch this, the Holy Spirit had not yet 
come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the, into the name of the Lord Jesus. You remember what I taught you on Sunday? So they had just believed faith in Jesus. Jesus now was in their heart. They'd been water baptized, but the Holy Spirit had not filled them yet. The Holy Spirit was not yet upon them. He was in them, not upon them yet, until Peter and John come and start laying hands on him and praying for everybody to receive the fullness of the Spirit. Wow. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they all received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Holy Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Now, he had already been impressed. He was impressed by the, the healings. He was impressed by the deliverance. But now when he saw Peter and John lay hands on people and they got filled with the Spirit, he said, Whoa. And he offered them money and said, Give me this ability. I want this. I, 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 this, this is really cool. I'm willing to pay big money for this. He offered them money and he said, give me also this ability so that everybody that I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. He said, this is really cool. He said, I've been a magician all these years and I do a lot of tricks and I do a lot of magic and stuff, but whoa, this is special. I'm, I'm, I'll just pause there for one second before I read the rest of it. Because there's a lot of people who use this encounter here, this story, to say, well... They prayed for them to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it never says that there was anybody speaking in tongues in this particular text. What do you think captured Simon's attention? What was profound enough to call Simon, the magician, to offer his own money to buy the ability to lay hands on people? Because when they laid hands on people, God was shaking them, filling them with the Spirit, and they were praying in the Spirit, praying in other languages they had never learned. That was something Simon had never, ever seen before. That so impressed him. He said, let me pay for that. There's no other explanation for why Simon was acting the way that he was. He would have had to have seen the evidence, some evidence and some proofs of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Are you all with me? All right, let me continue to read. So... He wanted to pay for it, right? And then Peter answered in verse 20 and said, Peter answered and said, May your money perish with you. Because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry. You can't be a part of my ministry. No, because your heart is not right before God. Verse 22, so what, what did he tell him to do? Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and you are captive to sin. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll stop there. It just goes ahead and completes the story. All right, so this is... A, this section, I call this true evangelism, exposes false faith. Now listen carefully to me. I'll just take five to ten minutes to wrap up. There will always be counterfeits. This guy was a phony. Simon the magician was a phony. He was fake. He had certain abilities that were given to him by the devil. And he was using them to manipulate people and to make money off of them. Counterfeits are not unique to the book of Acts. In fact, you can expect to see the closer we get to the return of Jesus, the end times, you're going to see more and more counterfeit ministries. So that's why you and I have to absolutely know God's word and have the discernment of the Holy Spirit so that we know what's fake and what isn't. Peter knew instantly. 
He read that guy's mail. He discerned exactly what was going on in his heart. So we see there are certain characteristics that we can learn from these verses that we read. In verses 9 through 11, we see the counterfeits, the, the characteristics of this phony guy named Simon the magician. I, I just list very quickly three for you. Three characteristics of someone who's phony and a false minister like this. Number one, they will exalt a person other than Christ. Was Simon exalting someone else? Who was it? Himself. Number two, they will attract a following based on carnal appetites. In other words, based on ego and based upon selfish ambition, they will start to attract a following. We see that in verse 10. And then in verse 11, we see that they, he was exercising this counterfeit power. Those three characteristics describe for us someone who is phony, who is a false minister. Can I just say this to you? I hope you don't take this as a judgmental spirit. I don't mean it that way. But there are many people in the body of Christ and who actually have a big following who fit those three characteristics. They're all about building up themselves, bring attention to themselves, building up their brand, want everybody to follow them. They want big time money for their gift, for their ministry, what they do. And then sometimes they're actually exercising counterfeit power. Listen, don't be deceived to think that only God does supernatural things. The devil does supernatural things as well. It's just coming from the wrong source. Be discerning. Recognize that there are false ministries around. So we see the characteristics of the phony. Let's go to the next slide. Then we read about the conversion of the magician. That was a great part of the story, wasn't it? We see the salvation, true salvation of Simon. He believed. He was baptized in, in water and he experienced the fullness of the Holy Spirit. He was one of those that Peter and John were laying hands on. I just, it doesn't tell us, but I'm assuming he was one of those that Peter and John laid their hands on and probably even he was speaking in tongues. But something was going on in his heart. Something was going on in his heart. He was still controlled by fleshly desires, appetites, motivations. He was still all about himself. He was so addicted to self-promotion. See, th this was his whole life, just making himself famous. Anything in order to get people's following. His heart. Listen, did you know that we can receive Jesus, be water baptized, be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and still have our hearts not right with God? I know that's shocking for you to understand, believe. But you know why? It's because all of this is by grace. We're saved by grace, not because we're perfect. Amen? We receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. These are grace outpourings, not because we earn them. You can't buy them. You can't earn them. There was something going on in his heart. His heart wasn't totally right with God yet. He had just come to Jesus. He was a new believer. But he had this wicked stuff in his heart. And let's see what happened. Then we see a confrontation between Peter and this phony. Verse 20 through 24 that I already read to you. And we see that Peter's response to him when he, offered, when he asked to buy this gift, he said, I'll pay you money for it. Peter, I'm sure there was a pause. We don't, we're not told here, but I'm sure there was a pause and a moment where Peter was looking at him and he was discerning, thinking, what is going on here? This guy is asking to buy that spiritual gift? And then he directly responded to him in a very personal way. Now, I don't know whether he did this in front of a crowd, whether he did it in private, I don't know. But all I know, it was very personal. And he makes three statements to Simon the magician. Number one, he said, you cannot buy this gift. 
Things of God cannot be purchased with money. Supernatural ministry cannot be bought with money. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care what your net worth is. I don't care whether you're the poorest man in, in Cape Town. You can have the grace of God and the gifts of God because you can't buy them with money. So the first statement that he told him, he said, Simon, you cannot buy this gift. Number two, what he basically said is, you're demonized. His, I mean, I'm putting it blunt today. You're demonized. He said, the, devil's got a, the devil is motivating you. His exact words is what? He said, you have no part in this ministry because your heart is not right for God. He said, repent of this wickedness. And then he goes on later to say in verse 23, for I can see, in other words, he's discerning, for I discern and I see that you are full of bitterness and you are in bondage and captive to sin. Doesn't it make sense as someone who's been a sorcerer for all these years using witchcraft that he himself needed some deliverance? Yeah. Wouldn't you agree with that? Did you know in parts of Asia uh, that I'm familiar with, uh, particularly in Thailand and other countries in Southeast Asia, when people come to Jesus and they're one uh, saved in the church, people went them to Jesus, do you know what after they're baptized in water, you know what one of the first things that they do in ministry, they're taught to do there? They go to their houses and they go through and get rid of every idol in their house. And they pray a deliverance prayer over their entire family. This is like days after they get saved. This is just their normal part of discipleship. They want to make sure because there's so much idolatry, so much witchcraft that goes on in those countries, they want to make sure that they break the, break the authority of the devil over their lives. Well, Simon needs some deliverance. Amen? His heart, he was a cow captive he even identified what his root issues were he said bitterness you've got real deep seated bitterness in your life i don't need to tell you all how bad bitterness is do i no bitterness will lead you to all kinds of bondage and he said you're captive to sin you're in bondage to sin is actually controlling your life he said you've got to repent Three things he told him. You can't buy the gift. Number two, you're being demonized. The devil's got a hold of you, even though you just got saved. And number three, he said, you got to repent. Repentance never seems to be in the New Testament, never seems to me to be some optional part of our message. Having a change of mind, a change of heart, is simply a part of getting right with God. Repent. Some of us, I think it's repentance is a lost art. Because I don't hear many Christians today wanting to talk about repenting. I say, well, you know, I kind of did this and, you know, I'm trying to get my life right with God. You know, I've kind of got off track a little bit. I've not really been, really not been praying lately, haven't been in the word I haven't been tithing in the last year, but I, I'm, I'm working on it. L -l -l listen to me. If you are not right with God in some way, whatever's going on, your first response needs to be, I repent. I'm changing my mind about what I'm doing. And I, I have a deep sense of regret and sorrow and I'm changing my mind and I'm going this way, no longer this way. That is a very decisive turn. It's not some gradual, well, I'm going to think about it and I'm going to go through a year of therapy and then maybe I'll finally get, I'll get things right with my marriage. and Repent! Don't lose that message. So we've seen an unstoppable church that got exploded out of Jerusalem, scattering. But boy, when they were scattered, they took advantage of the persecution. And it led them to true evangelism. And when there's true evangelism, it'll always expose fake stuff. It'll expose false ministry. And the same thing happens even today. 
May I just conclude with just a quick review of what I call lessons to learn? Can I just give them to you very, very quickly? Because it, let me just tell you what I figured out. Whenever I read the Bible, when I study the Bible, I want to make sure I don't just gather information. I want to, I want to say, God, what, are you, what do I leave here with? What, what is a, a takeaway? Something for me to apply to my life. And I made a note of a few things. I'll just give them to you very quickly, all right? You ready? Here, number one, in, in our lesson tonight, we learned that God will use adversity to lead us into obedience. God can even use adversity to lead us into obedience. Number two, evangelism should be integral to our lifestyle. Everywhere they went, they preached. Why? Because they had already built it into their lifestyle. Evangelism should be integral to our lifestyle. How about yours? Number three, we should expect signs and wonders to confirm the gospel. We should expect that in our lives. Number four, false ministries and counterfeits are going to mark the last days. False ministries and counterfeits are going to mark the last days. Number five, God's power can reach anyone. Even Simon the Magician. Even your most atheistic friend. Anybody. No matter how dark, God's power can reach them. Number six, God's gifts cannot be purchased with money. They're a result of grace. They're a result of grace. And number seven, you and I, we must guard ourselves and our hearts from impure motivations and carnal appetites. We all have to guard our hearts. May I pray with you tonight? I know I just threw those at you very quickly. I'll give the notes to someone where in case you miss it, you have them. What I want to lead you in prayer tonight, I want you just to agree with me that God will take us and make us the unstoppable church. Let, 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 let's not force persecution. <laughs> How about that? Is that a good point to agree? That we avoid the persecution? Because I, I, I'll just tell you, I really believe if, if there's not an awakening of God's people, and if we don't get out of our comfort zone, we're going to force God to make things uncomfortable around us. Don't do that. Let's just be obedient. Let's be the church. Let's be radical. Let's make a difference. Let's be the unstoppable church. Would you stand to your feet as I pray? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you said you're going to build your church and your church would be unstoppable, militant, radical, we see in Acts chapter 8 in the first part that we read tonight, Lord, we see the church being scattered but being greatly, mightily used. Lord, we pray that we would use this lesson tonight as an example for each of us. That we would learn what it means to share a true gospel. Lord God, that you would teach us how to walk in the Spirit, how to move in signs and wonders. Lord, that you would teach us to recognize and discern fake, phony, false ministry. Lord God, we don't want any part of it. Lord, we're thankful tonight that your gifts are come by grace. <laughs> we don't have to have money to buy it. We don't need to afford it. Lord, we simply need to be available. It's not affordability, it's availability. So Lord, tonight, let us...